Do we really need a sign to live, laugh, and love? Yes. The answer is no. I can help new homeowners not become their parents. Kiana. Nope. Koei No. Joaquin. No. It just takes practice. Give it a shot. <sighs> Do you hear that? Yeah. It's a constant battle. We're going to open a PDF. Who's next? Progressive can't save you from becoming your parents, okay. but we can save you money when you bundle home an auto with us. No fussing, no cussing, and no laughing. All right. Who knows what the subscribe button does? It gives us more videos about parental morphosis, which if you're watching, you probably need. Oh, oh, let's use our thumbs, remember? Yeah? yeah. There he is. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I absolutely love those commercials. Every time I see that very last scene with the guy like going like this on his phone, it makes me think of Ricky because we're always helping him with technology, different things. So I was busting up when I was watching that. But these, these commercials are absolutely hilarious uh, because we really think of growing up and we think of maturing. And, and we see that maturing and growing up is actually a, a really hard thing. One of the hardest transitions in life is actually uh, the moment of either leaving high school and transitioning into the adult life, uh, if they don't go to college or if a student leaves college and graduates and transitions into adulting, uh, it's actually one of the hardest seasons of life to try and navigate and figure out because you're paying bills, you're, you know, millennials have kind of coined the term adulting and adulting is hard, but growing up we see it's quite difficult at different times. We, we struggle with just knowing what's next and we kind of laugh at this commercial, but it's really fun because it, it's nice to see that they have somebody who's like, hey, let me kind of teach you how to walk. Let me make sure you don't turn into your parents. But as we think of growing and maturing, it would be quite nice to have somebody in our life constantly who's like walking alongside of us, who's saying, hey, let me, let me just walk with you and teach you how to navigate being a parent. Let me walk with you and teach you and let you navigate. And, and as we navigate how to be married or how to be single, how to jump into a new career, how to write a resume, right? Like all these things, it'd be super amazing to have someone walking alongside of us, helping us grow in different areas of life. And the same is true for our own walk with Christ, right? The same is true as we walk with Jesus. It would be so beautiful and wonderful as we walk with the Lord and as we grow in our maturity in Christ, if we had someone to walk with us, right? And so as we've been talking about our vision statement as a church, right, a family to belong to, a family to grow with, and a family to go with, today we're going to talk about what it means to be a family to grow with, because God has given us a family, each other, to grow with, to grow in maturity and stature with Christ. And so as we open up the book of Colossians, we're going to see what it really means to grow in maturity in three different movements. And first, we'll see what the mystery of God is that has been revealed. Second, we'll see the goal of maturity. And third, we're going to see the desire for maturity, the desire for maturity. So the letter of Colossians opens up, uh, and we see it's written by the Apostle Paul, right, to the churches in Colossae, and he writes to them this beautiful prayer that he's just praying over them. He's grateful for the Lord, and then he moves into this poem that just shows us how amazing and central Jesus is to our faith, and he's just got these beautiful words, and if you've never read the opening to Colossians 1, please take some time today, later today, to read that. It is so refreshing to your heart to just soak in the, that, that prayer and then the poem that he's got right after it. But it gets us to verse 24 where we're going to start today to see what the mystery revealed is that Paul speaks of. And so if you would, please open up again to Colossians chapter 1 and we're going to start reading in verse 24. It says this. Now I rejoice in my sufferings. For you and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is, the church. I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul begins talking about 
rejoicing in his suffering, right? In verse 21, 24, he starts talking about this rejoicing and suffering. And when we read that sentence, we start to go rejoicing, suffering. How do those two things go together? Like, it doesn't really seem like you should have joy in the midst of a really hard season or have joy in suffering. It, it just feels like that's quite difficult. But Paul, over and over again, talks about rejoicing and suffering, right? He mentions it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In the book of Philippians, right, it's there multiple times as he continues to write about rejoicing in the suffering, to count it all as joy. And we hear that again here in the book of Colossians, that Paul is rejoicing in the midst of his suffering, and he's saying the suffering is worth it because of what Christ has done. The suffering is worth it because of what Jesus has done and who he is. And he starts pointing this picture for us to see that his suffering is so worth moving the kingdom of God forward. Because Paul's gone through some serious suffering, right? We read through the books of Acts that he goes to court multiple times, that he's shipwrecked, that he goes to jail. He writes most of his letters from prison. Like the man truly suffered and went through some hard seasons, and yet he still had so much joy because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has done for him. And he's seeing church plants, right? Being, being planted. He's seeing dozens and hundreds of people come to faith in Jesus Christ, and he says, it's all worth it. The suffering is completely worth it, and the Spirit of God comforts Paul in the midst of his suffering, and he just presses on forward to say, I can joyfully suffer, because I know that my God is using all of these things that I'm going through, using these hardships to move the kingdom forward. And, and he starts painting this picture for us to see, man, what was lacking in the church, right? He kind of talks about that, and it's kind of confusing. What do you mean, what was lacking in the church? And so he paints this picture for us to say, hey, his suffering, Paul's suffering is visual for the churches to see, right? They've met Paul. They've seen him. They, they hear about how he's toiling and struggling. And so the suffering that actually Christ went through on the cross for us, the suffering that he walked through as people mocked him, spit upon him, beat him, and then murdered him, it's a similar view for them to see a brother in Christ walk through suffering. It's like uh, the first time maybe you watch The Passion of the Christ, the movie, right? Like we know that Jesus had died for us, but the first time you watch that movie and you see the visual uh, of what the actor portraying Jesus as, the suffering that Christ went through almost becomes so much more real to us. Because it's a visual to see. And so that's what Paul is saying, that the suffering that he's walking through is allowing them to see some way uh, that what Jesus suffered is a little more visual for them and before them so that they could completely understand what Christ went through. And it's all worth it, that Jesus did it. And he, it was worth it for him to bring us into his family, to die for us so that we would be in a right relationship with him, so that we, we would come to know him and Paul says, it's totally worth it to rejoice in my suffering because Jesus is doing so much more through my suffering. And he continues on to talk about suffering for the sake of the kingdom and being a servant that God has commissioned him, that God has sent him, right? What has he sent him on? What, what commission has, be, has he been sent on? He, he says right in verse 25 that the word of God would be fully known, to present the word of God fully known. Right? So that people would hear of what God has done. That people would hear this message, this proclamation of who Jesus is. And that's why he's going through all of this. This is the servant who is being sent to tell of who the king is, to present the word of God fully known, so that it would be revealed to people. And he says the suffering is totally worth it. And then he moves on to verse uh, 26 and 27 to start talking about this mystery that's been revealed. The mystery that's been revealed before them. And we hear this language that Paul uses multiple times in different letters as he's talking about this mystery. As you read the epistles, look for, for this uh, term because he uses it constantly to draw out for us the beauty uh, that Jesus has come to die for us. Right? That it's not just that the Jews could have salvation, but so could the Gentiles. That they were co-heirs. That they inherited the kingdom of God as well. And we covered that just a few weeks ago as we walked through Galatians chapter 3 and 4. That we are also adopted as co-heirs into the family of God. And that's the mystery being revealed to them. That there was a Messiah who came to die for their sin. 
who paid the price so that they could inherit the kingdom of God, so that they could be called sons, so that they could look to the Father and actually cry out, Abba, Father, that the Spirit of God would dwell within them and move their lives from death to life, to move them into a right relationship with God, that the mystery had finally been revealed. And he's telling all of the saints, he's telling all of the believers, he's saying, see this mystery be revealed. And we get to see that mystery revealed here today. Because as we think and read the Bible, as we see what Scripture tells us, as we hear about the proclamation of the Word and the good news of Jesus Christ, that mystery is revealed clearly for us today. That it is true that we also could be adopted into the family. That Jesus also died for our sin right where we're at. That we don't have to clean ourselves up. That we don't have to work hard to earn favor with him. We don't have to try to impress him. We don't have to try to be the, the best people we could be. But that Jesus saves us exactly where we're at in our mess. And he continues to move towards us. And that we could be in a right relationship with him. That we could have intimacy with the God of the universe. While we don't deserve it, he still gave it to us. While we were far from him, he ran after us. The mysteries revealed to us, and we could have everlasting life with him. Friends, if you have not given your life to Christ, if you have not sat before the Lord and given him everything, and said, you are my Savior and my Lord, would you do that today? Because the mystery is clearly revealed for each and every single one of us, that we could trust him with all things, that he's the God of the universe who holds all things together like Ricky was talking about. He's the sustainer, creator. He's the one who came for us, who died a, a painful, suffering death for us. Also that we could be in a right relationship with him, so that we could know him, so that we could praise him and worship him. Because he is worthy. He deserves all the glory. Would you come to know Jesus today? Would you give your life over to him? And believer, if you've been walking with Jesus for years, would you see the beauty of who he is and what he's done over and over again? Would you continually see the mystery that's right before your eyes, that the Spirit of God dwells with you, that he says, I will never leave you or forsake you, that I'm with you till the end of the age, that God dwells with you, and while you didn't deserve it, he still gave you life with him. That he suffered on a cross for you. And when we walk through suffering, we can do it joyfully for the sake of the kingdom. Because we have salvation with the God of the universe who allowed us to be a part of his family. Would you remember this truth that's been revealed to us forever, right? Because we get to have eternity with him. We get to sing praises to him over and over again. The mystery hidden has clearly been revealed to us over and over again so that we would see him all the more beautifully. And he starts talking about this hope, right? This hope that we can have in Christ. And when we think of the word hope, we often think, um, hope is something that might happen. Like, I hope I'm going to be able to get McDonald's chicken nuggets after church today. <laughs> like, that's a pretty good hope, but I don't know if it's going to happen. But the certain hope that we see in Scripture is true. There is absolute certainty in knowing that Jesus Christ is coming back for us. That he's going to restore all things and make all things new. And that we get to have eternity with him. The king, the God of the universe. That's a certain hope. It's not something that we think might happen. It is true and it's going to happen. That's what we look forward to. A certain hope. Not a hope that we're uh, just thinking would potentially happen and, and hoping for, but an actual truth that we can look towards and say, yes, my God is returning. My God will restore all things. My God will make all things new. And I get to be with my God till the end uh, for all of eternity. That's a true hope that we look forward to, that the Word of God clearly reveals to us as it's been presented to us, as He's given us His Word. We get to see how certain we can be in our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Complete certainty in who Jesus is and what He's done for us. Complete certainty in knowing that He dwells within us, that He's given us His Holy Spirit and adopted us into this family. That's the mystery that's been revealed. Would you rejoice in that truth? 
even in the midst of suffering as Paul did? Would you rejoice in the moments where it's hard, but yet Jesus is still at work in your own heart? Would you rejoice when you feel in the, like you're mundane, but yet Christ is still at work with you and he dwells within you? That the Spirit of God is with us here today. The mystery has clearly been revealed for us. But God, while he saves us exactly where we're at, He doesn't desire to keep us there. He desires us to continue to grow forward and move forward and and to see maturity in our own walk with him, right? While he saves us where we were at, he still desires for us to mature in our relationship with him. So let's keep reading about the goal of maturity that we see in verse 28. We proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. We see that Paul has a clear desire to proclaim Christ, right? He desires to share Christ with others. That's why he keeps traveling. That's why he goes to other churches. That's why he goes to other places that haven't had the gospel preached. He desires for the proclamation of Christ to be made. He desires for uh, people to no longer sit under false teaching. He desires to see maturity happen in the life of the believer so that they would know what is true and what isn't true, so that everyone may be presented mature in Christ is what the scriptures tell us. How many of us uh, maybe set a New Year's resolution this year? Show hands. One. One person? Dang. Two? Okay. Sweet. I set a a, a New Year's resolution. Uh, Goal setters. I love goals. Uh, And some of you guys might really like goals. Huh? Any gram threes? Yeah! No? Okay. Uh, Anyway, uh, so these New Year's resolutions, they might look like, hey, losing weight, getting connected, watching less Netflix. I need that one. Uh, Reading more books, growing in your walk with Jesus. Right? These are all goals that we kind of set at the beginning of the year. Say, this year I hope to see this happen. And we want to see a change in our life. So as believers, as Christians, what's the goal? What's the goal of the life of a believer? Now, I don't mean the goal in a way that we just check the box off of something, right? Because some of those New Year's resolutions could quickly be things that we check off uh, our to-do list. But something we actually see changed and transformed in our life. What's the goal of the Christian? Well, it should be to know Christ more, right? To have greater intimacy with him, to look more like him, right? To see Jesus change our life. The goal for the believer should be to mature in their walk with Christ, to see maturity in their life, to grow with him. We clearly see that in verse 28. Jesus saves us where we're at, but he desires for us to grow. He desires for us to be mature in him, to have greater intimacy with him. He desires for us to see him more beautifully. And as we grow in our walk with Christ, the mystery that was revealed to us just unfolds with a wealth more to explore and to see and to walk with and to grow in. And we see this call to mature in Christ multiple different places in Scripture, right? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. It says, until we reach, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with stature measured by Christ's fullness, then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and with cleverness in the techniques of deceit, right? Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. Although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now everyone who lives on, on milk is inexperienced with the message about the righteousness, but because he is an infant, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have senses, who have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. See the theme here? Knowing between good and evil to mature, to see that. Romans 8.29. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. To be transformed by the renewal of the mind, says Roman, Romans 12. Colossians chapter 2, literally just a couple of verses later. Verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, 
Lord, continue to live in him, being rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing with gratitude. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on earthly things. Clearly, God desires for us to mature. Clearly, God desires for us to grow in our relationship with him, to grow in our intimacy with him, to grow in our maturity, as he says over and over again. And so often, as we saw in those scriptures, that's just a few of them, a lot of it is to help distinguish knowing what is true and what is not true, right? Knowing what is evil and wicked versus knowing what is good and godly and holy. Christ wants us to mature. And And we tend to expect growth and maturity to happen in all stages of life, right? We tend to see and expect growth and maturity in different areas. Like at work, you probably have to learn new skills every so often. You have to go to some certain trainings or take some classes to keep improving or learning more about the job. Or in school, literally the whole purpose of school is to grow and to learn some things and to continue to develop We expect this in every area of life, but as we think of the lives of Christians, for some reason we've said it's okay to just stay where you're at and not actually grow intentionally. Over time, we can get okay with not connecting in God and his word year in and year out. Or or we can get okay with never actually growing in our character. Or, Or being okay with not actually serving others. Or being okay with not sharing the gospel with others. And yet, Scripture calls us to much more. God himself calls us to much more, to grow in our maturity, to grow in our walk with Christ himself. We're not supposed to just make converts. We're supposed to make disciples. Friends, this is what God is calling us to, to grow in maturity of Christ. Imagine this. An infant, see, maybe in the hallways, a kid who's just a small toddler child who walks around with their bottle of milk their binky in their mouth, and their blanket, who's walking around. That's kind of like, that's adorable. That's so cute. It makes sense. Now, picture that being a 10-year-old kid. That just doesn't make any sense at all to see a 10-year-old who still has their bottle, a blanky, and a binky in their mouth, right? So why are we okay with that in the life of a believer? to be saved and to stay exactly where you're at, but see no maturity in their walk with Christ, right? It it just doesn't make any sense. We should desire to see this growth and maturity in our own life, in our own walk with Christ, and in each other's, right? Now, why do we believe this? Why do we think that's okay? Well, I think there's a couple of different reasons why uh, we've started to believe the lie that it's okay to not mature. The first lie that I think we've kind of stepped into is what I call the, the amateur expert lie. The amateur expert lie. This lie tells us that the pastor, right, the preacher is supposed to do all of the ministry. They're supposed to know all of the answers. They do everything, uh, and they have more direct access to God, or that uh, they uh, will know every single problem, know how to solve every single problem, right? This is not me trying to get out of doing stuff, I promise. It's not, but I'm just showing us that this is a lie that Jesus clearly didn't just rely on people who were experts. Jesus used ordinary people throughout the scriptures to plant churches, to share the gospel, to be martyrs over and over again. As we've studied the book of Acts, one common thing that we see is that God uses ordinary people for extraordinary things. He doesn't just rely on experts. Over and over again, Jesus uses the ordinary people to make disciples, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to equip the saints, right? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, ministry, to build up the body of Christ. My job is actually to help you guys grow in doing the ministry. My job is not doing all of the ministry, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Count how many times Paul, the Apostle Paul in verse 28 of Colossians chapter 1 says everyone. In the ESV, he says it three times. 
in one verse, everyone mature in Christ. In the CSB, he says it twice. But we see that everyone in the family is supposed to be presented mature, right? That we should strive to see maturity happen in our life. So the first lie is the expert amateur divide. Uh, I would love to see that totally eliminated, that there would not be an expert amateur divide, but that we would all be growing in Christ together, right? The second lie is that it just doesn't matter if we grow. It doesn't matter if we grow in our relationship with Christ. We, we tend to believe sometimes that once we're saved, it's totally okay, and we're just going to leave our life there, and we're just going to be stagnant in our faith because we now get to go to heaven, and that's it. But Jesus calls us to so much more. He doesn't just call us to a decision in faith with him because a decision for Christ is not the finish line. God has called us to go, not to stand still. Jesus said, follow me. He didn't say, nice to meet you. I'll leave you there. See you later. He said, walk with me. Do life with me. Let's go make disciples together. He said, follow me, not stay there. And if we don't mature... If we truly think it doesn't matter, then we'll never know, right, how to distinguish between what is true and what is not true. We'll never know how to distinguish between what's evil and what's not evil because we're not, uh, we're not pursuing maturity in Christ. We're not pursuing growth in our relationship with him and knowing him more intimately, right? We'll miss out on the mystery of what God has revealed to us. We'll miss out on the glorious wonders as we explore who he is and, and he, totally have him change our lives and submit to him. The third lie that we believe is that we hold on to our sin, right? This is one where we say, okay, Jesus, you've saved me, but I don't want to let go of that. And I'm just going to hold on to that as much as I can. And we don't submit our entire lives to him completely. And when we hold on to our sin, it keeps us from maturing. It keeps us from growing in intimacy with him. It keeps us from totally walking with him more intimately. And in those moments, we're not totally submitting to him, right? We're saying, I want to hold on to this, and I don't want to hold on to you. I don't trust you with that, and I think you're going to make me do something I don't want to do, and I want to keep doing what I want to do. And that keeps us from maturing in our walk with Jesus. But God is calling us to be made mature, right? To be presented mature in Christ is what the scripture says. So there's plenty more things that probably keep us from growing mature, but what is maturity? If we're talking about maturity, what's it, what's it mean? What's it look like to be made mature in Christ, right? Being mature in Christ is not simply having a bunch of scripture memorized. There's loads of people who know a lot of scripture, who can quote it left and right, who aren't mature in their relationship with Jesus. The Pharisees are a clear example as we look at the scriptures. They knew the law, left and right. They knew all the rules, and yet they were so far from God because they didn't know him when he was right in front of their face. There's plenty of people who have all of that memorized, but that doesn't mean they're mature, right? Uh, having the best evangelism technique, so you have the proper way to uh, charismatically present the gospel to somebody. Having the, the best way to share the truth with someone, right? That doesn't mean you're mature if you have some great evangelism technique or if you sin less. You think that's maturity, right? Or, or if you think like you're going to heaven, that's maturity. But maturity, friends, is gaining Christ. Maturity is gaining Jesus. It's seeing the wealth of the mystery revealed to us, that we would grow in our intimacy with him, that we would continue to pursue a relationship with him, and that we would see him work and move in our lives, right? I, I love the, uh, one of the sections in Ephesians chapter 3. It says uh, something so beautiful that I think totally covers what it means to be mature in Christ Jesus. It's, it's loving Jesus and seeing him, but here's what it says. It says, being rooted and grounded in love. Would, that we would have the strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge that we may be filled with the fullness of God. That we would explore the length and the height and the depth and the riches. That we would be made full, that we would see the fullness of God for who he is. 
that we would be presented mature. Being mature in Christ is not simply following all of the rules. But maturity happens when we actually see movement in our walk with Jesus, right? Maturity happens when we're see, taking steps to be uh, in relationships with people. Maturity happens when we move towards God's people, right? When we move towards one another in relationships, we see discipleship happen in relationships. We see God using people to mature us, e- even if we don't exactly know everything, and we go and we say, hey, can we explore this together? We see maturity happen in the movement, and, and as we see God continue to move in our lives. We see maturity happen in our own spiritual disciplines, our own intimate time as we walk with Jesus. Maturity happens as we see the Lord do all these things, as we take time to spend time in his word, right? To sit with him and hear from him, to spend time in prayer, to spend time fasting, to spend time memorizing scripture. Again, it's not just the to-do list to do, but Jesus uses these things to mature us. The spirit of God uses these moments and this time we take to sit with him, to totally move in our life, to move us toward maturity. We see that God doesn't just save, God doesn't just leave us where he saved us, but he desires to make us mature. The Spirit of God moves in our lives using these different things to present us mature, that we would be made mature, that we would see movement in our growth, in our walk with Jesus. And I know there's probably some of you in the room who feel like you're just like, man, I don't know if I'm mature in Christ. And if that's you, if you're wondering that question, I want you to ask yourself, is there movement, right? Are you moving towards actually spending intimate time with him? Or are you just showing up and being a consumer? Is there movement towards actually spending time with him intimately in his word and in prayer? Towards community? Is there movement towards asking the Lord to grow you, right? To to allow the spirit of God to open up your heart so that you would walk closer to Jesus. That you would be conformed into his image all the more. Because that's how we see the Lord mature us. Right? That he continues to say, I saved you wherever you were. And now I desire so much more for you. So that you would continue to grow in your maturity and your walk with me. That's the goal. The goal is maturity. But we see that there's labor that comes with it. Right? We see that there's uh, toil and striving that comes with it. And so let's read verse 29 as Paul talks about the labor for maturity. He says, I labor for this striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. Paul tells us of the labor that it took, right? The labor of the, uh, that it took for him to go place to place, to share the gospel everywhere he went, to encourage church plants, to be in prison, to be shipwrecked, Right? He tells us of the labor that came with it, and he says he strives with all the strength that God has given him. That the Spirit of God dwells within him and gives him the power to continue to move on, gives him the endurance to keep running the race, that the Spirit of God dwells within him and gives him that endurance. Friends, our salvation is totally free. So as as we talk about maturity and growing in Christ, you, you can't do anything to earn your favor with God. But God has so graciously saved us as a free gift of salvation. But as we mature, we do use these tools, right, of spiritual disciplines to grow in our walk with Christ, of being in community to grow us right? Maturity involves work, but salvation is free. So please don't get me wrong. But Paul talks about this labor for maturity. And he says it even in first Corinthians 15, 10, he's talking about how hard he worked. He says, I've worked harder than anybody else. And the grace of God is what keeps me going. Jesus' Holy Spirit dwells within him and continues to move him forward towards greater maturity in Christ. And it takes work, right, to be disciplined. It takes, there's this labor for us as we mature with Jesus. There's this toil that we continue to run forward and go, oh my gosh, I'm waking up in the morning and I'm spending time with the Lord. I have to take time out of my day to make sure I'm actually meeting in community and meeting with other brothers and sisters to build these relationships so that we would hold each other accountable. It's like going to the gym, right? If I wanted to go get, if I wanted to get stronger, 
I'd have to cut time out of my day to go to the gym. I'd have to uh, cut time out of my day to actually go lift the weights and then go home and take a shower and then keep the rest of the day moving forward, right? There's the work that comes into it. The goal is getting stronger, but there's a process to getting stronger. There's lifting the weights, there's the cardio, there's eating, there's all that work that comes with it. And and like that, our maturity in Christ, there's these steps that we continue to uh, use as tools that the Lord uses that the Holy Spirit moves in in our lives to push us towards maturity in Christ. There's a labor in it. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. It says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And so what Paul is saying is discipline yourself through these practices so that you could be a, a more mature believer, so that you could be conformed into the image of Christ, like Romans 8.29 says, right? That the Spirit uses these disciplines to grow us in maturity with Christ. And God uses these moments to totally keep growing us in our walk with him, to have greater intimacy with him. It's not like uh, God may do this to some people, but I've never heard of it. It's, it's not like you're saved and then he just like gives you all the maturity, right? Like the Spirit of God uses people to disciple us, to encourage us, to teach us. The Spirit of God uses time to read our Bible, to grow uh, and learn more about who He is and what He's done. The Spirit of God uses our time in prayer as we commune with Him, to meet Him intimately. The Spirit of God uses fasting to speak to us when we feel like we're hungry. He feeds us with everything that we need Himself, right? God uses these disciplines to grow us And spiritual disciplines are not about making you more precious to God, but they're about making God more precious to you. That's what we see the Lord do in our spiritual disciplines. It's not about trying to clean ourselves up for Him, but it's about seeing Him all the more beautifully. Imagine this. God calls you. You get a phone call and it says, unknown. You answer it for some reason, even though everybody hangs up on those phone calls. But you pick it up, and it's God, and he says, hey, tomorrow morning, I'm sending Jesus to meet you at your doorstep. 30-minute meeting, he's got something he needs to say to you. You going to clear your schedule for that appointment? I would. It's Jesus. He's knocking on my door. I'm going to have a feast ready. I'm excited for that. Friends, you don't have to cancel that appointment because God's given us his word that speaks to us so clearly that is Jesus' word, right? The truth revealed to us that we get to spend intimate time with him. That's exactly what it is, right? Did you know that there was a recent study that came out a couple of uh, years ago that in Nebraska, in Nebraska alone, among evangelical Protestant believers... 97% of them said that their faith was important to them. 97% of them said that their faith was important to them. And then uh, out of that 97% that said, hey, my faith is important, 47% of them say they never spend time in their Bible. 47% of them said they never actually read their Bible, but they said it was important to them. 26% of that 97% said they do it once a week. Jesus desires to meet with us each morning, each day. And it's right before us. This is God's word. Do we have reverence for it? Spend intimate time with him in prayer, to meet with him, to ask him to do some beautiful things in our life. Friends, God desires to grow us Again, verse 29 says that we should strive with all of his strength in us. We discipline, but God's strength uses the discipline in us, right? To grow us with him. If you're in a season, and I've heard plenty of people say this and ask this question. And Alex, I just don't have a desire to open my Bible. I don't have a desire to to pray and to spend time with the Lord. I don't have a desire to to keep growing it in this season of life. I want to encourage you that if that's you, or if you come to that season of life, right, where you feel like you don't have that desire, I want to encourage you to always look forward 
to look towards the goal, right? The end result. And, and picture that. I've got a couple of people who I walk with, who I look up to, and I see, man, I want to finish like they're finishing. I want to finish like Eric Knoll. I want to finish like Dean Waddell when I'm 80-some years old, still making sure to reach my neighbors and share the gospel with them. I want to make sure I'm investing in the next generation, and I want to pursue Jesus intimately. And it's those moments when, when I don't have like a desire to open up time or to set time to meet with the Lord, right, in prayer or in his word or, or to practice other spiritual disciplines. It's those moments where I have to remind myself of what I hope to finish like. That I look forward to the direction that I hope I'm headed to see Jesus totally move in my life and conform me more into his image. That I look forward to those moments and I go, Lord, I want to finish like that. Would you keep pushing me forward? And the Spirit of God uses that to totally point me forward. So if you're in that season, think of people that you look up to. Think of people that you're like, man, I want to finish like them. I want to keep pursuing Jesus like them. And I promise that will encourage you. It's like picking up a guitar and trying to learn how to play it, right? We don't like the moments where we're sitting there and we're like, oh, my fingers hurt. I don't want to play anymore. But yet you keep thinking of how how you're going to be able to play a song in a couple of months or weeks. You keep thinking about maybe if you're a kid and you want to be a a, a rock star and you're like, oh, one day I'm going to play before thousands of people. And that excitement is what keeps moving you forward, right? The direction that you're headed in. My guitar is collecting dust at home, by the way, in case you guys were wondering. But keep that direction in front of yourself. Okay, i got to keep going. I'm on Ricky pace. Um, So, uh, (laughs) friends, Paul, one thing that I love in this section is that Paul totally loves to see other people grow. He absolutely loves to see people grow because we can hear his toil and his desire for people to be presented mature in Christ. And it's one of my favorite things when I hear stories or when I'm sitting with some of you guys and I see the light bulb click. And I see your excitement for Jesus just totally start going wild. It is one of my favorite things to see that. And because we're supposed to be a family to grow with, not just a family to grow by ourselves. But we grow intimately in our relationships with one another. And so do you have that same desire, right? Do you have that same desire to see other people in our church family grow in their maturity of Christ? to disciple one another, to equip and encourage one another over and over again. That's what we desire, is to be a family to grow with, to see Jesus grow us in our own walks with Christ. And so how do we mature here at South? What's maybe our discipleship pathway, so to speak? How do we mature in Christ? Uh, What are things that we are asking the Lord to use to grow us and that we've kind of put in place for us to grow in our maturity of Christ? Well, the first one is Sunday mornings right? The preaching of the word, that it would wash over us and that the Holy Spirit would use that to encourage us, to equip us, to grow us into greater maturity with Christ, uh, to sing songs to King Jesus, that he would speak to us in those moments, that the Spirit of God would just totally move in our hearts, the time and prayer and communion that we have to worship the Lord all the more, to remember what he's done for us. The second thing that we've got in place that we desire to see the Spirit of God use to grow us in maturity with Christ is city groups. We don't just promote city groups just to promote them, but we truly believe God uses these relationships, these uh, missional communities to grow us in great relationship with each other, but always to catapult us towards mission and to point us forward to each other, to disciple one another, to have rich relationships with each other. And the third one is huddles. We, we told you guys uh, when, at the end of the year that we desire to see huddles totally flourish in our church. And the huddles are these three uh, small groups um, of three to five people, gender specific, where you meet regularly, speak into God's word and what he's doing in your own walk with Christ, right? To pray for one another, to do ministry together, to uh, hold each other accountable. I'm hearing stories of, of people who literally, I, I was hanging out with St- Todd Stiskel a couple of weeks ago and I was seeing him and he would not stop talking about how his huddle has totally transformed his own walk with Christ. He says his whole life is completely changed because of how God has used his huddle and two other men in the church to truly care for him and disciple him. He says, man, I have such a fire and a hunger to be in God's word because of these guys. It is unbelievable how God uses other people to disciple us, to encourage us, to move in our hearts, to stir up a greater infection, uh, affection for Christ. 
I desire for each of us to continue to grow in our walk with Jesus in the midst of that. That God would use us, each other, to disciple one another, to encourage us, to equip us, to move us towards him all the more deeply. The last one is that we see uh, classes. We hope to continue to uh, have these different classes, right? Jimmy's going to be teaching the foundations class in a couple of weeks to answer these questions. And if you know the answer to the questions, it's still good to go and be refreshed by that, to remember all of this stuff that God's doing. If you don't know the answer to those questions, to be a catalyst in your own heart so that you would grow and greater maturity in Christ, that you would continue to learn more about who Jesus is. And the last one is that uh, maturity happens in ministry. Maturity happens in ministry. Friends, I've seen people who think they can't lead a small group conversation say yes after challenging them multiple times, and then they do it, and it is amazing. They study, they work hard, and they come out of it so excited at what God taught them and how uh, God used them in the midst of, of them leading small group. It is amazing to see people who go, I don't know how to share the gospel, but have a desire to learn and grow how to share the gospel. And so they volunteer in the kids' ministry where they share the gospel every single Sunday and now have a greater desire to share it with people that they're around. God uses ministry to mature us. Right? Don't feel like you have to hang on and wait until you know all of the answers to step into some opportunity to serve. God desires to grow you. My very first time leading a Bible study, I don't even think I was saved if I go back to that time. I really don't. Like, but my buddy Sam, he was just like, hey, you're going to lead the men's Bible study and we're in college. And I was like, are you sure? And he goes, here's the questions. Just read the verses and ask the questions. And I did it. Because he kind of made me. <laughs> but God used that to mature me, right? Maturity happens in ministry. Maturity is weird. Growing is hard. There's growing pains. But God's given us each other to grow with, right? To encourage each other, each other in the moments where we feel like we don't have a desire to mature. Or we feel like we're stagnant. To come alongside of each other, a family to grow with, and just like the commercial, they have that guy who's walking alongside of them so they don't turn into their parents. We have each other to walk alongside of each other so that we would look more like Jesus. I have this desire, this huge desire, this dream, to see a day in the life of our church where every single person who comes in on Sunday morning can say, I'm in a huddle with so-and-so. I'm discipling them, and they're discipling me. And, it, and if they can't say that, it's because they're new to the church or because someone brought them because they're on mission for them. What a dream. God could do that and much more. Friends, I, I hope and pray that we would continue to grow and mature together that we would be a family who is being brought up, trained, rooted, and grounded in love to make disciples who are growing together. That South, that City Light South would be a place where we would present everyone mature. Let's pray. Father, I thank you uh, so much for how good and gracious you are. I thank you so much for how you've saved us exactly where we're at, that the mystery is revealed to us. Lord, I pray and I ask that you would continue to do a good work in the life of our church family. That we would continue to walk towards maturity. That we would not stay stagnant, but that you would continue to do something in our hearts. That you would light a fire in our hearts to grow us. To have greater intimacy with you. Not just simply to check off some boxes but to see the mystery revealed to us and explore the wondrous things to grow to the fullness and in the stature that we would be conformed into your image, Jesus, that we would equip the saints for the work of ministry, that we would make disciples and see real growth happen in the life of our own hearts. Jesus, we know that you could do this and much more, and so we pray and we ask in your beautiful name. Amen.